we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Amen. Well, how do you like that to begin, huh? That's a good uplifting passage, isn't it? Let's see, anger is just as bad as murder. Does anybody go to communion and still be angry with somebody else? Shouldn't do that. Ever insult someone? If you did, that leads to hell. Adultery, that's really bad according to Jesus. Even lusting after a woman, that's tantamount to adultery. To lust requires, requires you to tear out your eye if you looked at somebody and to throw it away. Otherwise you go to hell. If you've touched a woman inappropriately, you need to take off your arm and throw it away. Otherwise you go to hell. This is Jesus who is talking. Jesus is talking. Marrying a divorced woman's adultery. As far as promises are concerned, have you ever made a promise that you couldn't keep? Jesus doesn't like that either. If you've messed up, you made a promise, bad news. You simply should be thankful to be alive. You simply say yes, yes to people, and no, no to people, but you never make a promise because you never know if you're going to be around tomorrow to keep it. So this is a heavy, heavy passage. And we, in our arrogance, think we can do it all. So what do we do with passages like this? Do we simply, well, some people like cut them out of the Bible and snip them and throw them away and burn them and say, I'm just taking this chapter and this verse, but I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. Sometimes that makes sense. But the problem is scripture hangs together as a whole. If you're a chopper and a splitter and you take passages out, you destroy the entire Bible. So our challenge is to find out how we keep this passage in scripture and also how we interpret it. If you're a literalist and you're really on your soapbox and you really want to put everybody to hell, then you say you've got to follow that to the nth degree. One, two, three, four. Do it to the nth degree. And if you don't, you get kicked out, pushed away, or excommunicated. The problem is that the Episcopals, the Lutherans, the Catholics don't take that version. And I'm glad they don't take that version. Um, that's a tough way to go. We interpret it slightly differently. We're always looking, what's the meaning behind the passage? Why is Jesus saying this? Um, why is Matthew quoting it in such a, a fiery way to where there's hell all over? If you know anything about Matthew, he was the Jewish tax collector who was talking to the Jews. And he was a really hard person to get along with. So as soon as you did something wrong, the hell with this, the hell with that. And say, he's, just a, he's the hell guy, he really is. If you wanted to see something differently, you would go to the Gospel of John, where everything is love, almost to the other extreme. So you could pick up love there. And that's really the bottom of what Matthew's trying to get at. Um, so you and I have a choice about how to interpret this passage. Don't chop it out. Don't chop it up and chop, throw it out. Keep it, keep it in, but take a look at the context in which it's written. So you don't have to, have to worry about what this passage is going to do to you. Um, there's, some, there's something below it, and it's about relationship. Jesus is really in this passage addressing the fundamental, under, fundamental fault, fault of all human beings, and that's not wanting to be in an honest relationship with God or others. If you're getting a relationship with somebody and you want to, want to get out because you see somebody better. You really didn't have an honest relation with that person or with God. So we look at these, at these deeper things. If you look at murder and you say, you know, I shouldn't be doing that, but I get angry at somebody that I would like to murder them, maybe someday you will. That also goes to the fundamental flaw of what's going on with us. We don't have a right relationship with others or God. Moreover, Jesus is taking a look at, I think, at the motivation for doing certain things. He's hitting the core of why we lust after other people, why we become angry, why we're willing to lie, and more importantly, why we don't want to follow Jesus, really. 
who say we want to follow, but in reality, it's just too painful to follow. We'd rather have a little bit of our own way. Our relationship with God's lacking, so we cover up, we pretend that we're somebody else. We pretend that we're better than we actually are. We project that to people. We're the best suit and clothes. We look really good. We've got the best, you know, the best car or whatever you want to do. And so we, we have this artificial impression that we give to people. And Jesus is, is cutting down underneath that and says, I made you good the way you are. You don't have to put on pretenses. Just the way you are. And you can say, well, other people won't accept me. And God says, but I do. I accept you. Don't worry about it. And we say, we don't really trust that. And Jesus says, trust that. Otherwise, you're going to end up like the stuff in Matthew. God really cares about your heart. And that's what he's looking at in this passage. He's caring about people's hearts. They get into trouble because they haven't tended to their heart. Sometimes people have their heart and their clothes, houses, political parties, religious beliefs. That's where their heart is. You know, go for it. Your heart needs to follow God wherever it is. If you lust after somebody, there's no true heart. If you lie, you brag about yourself. If you're married because it's the right family or the wealth that you might get. Because of fantasy, maybe you belong not to God. If you decide to play around in a committed relationship, your heart is with yourself and not with God. So it's looking back to that center of being with God at all times. That's tough stuff. I know it. I get it. God gets it. It's tough stuff. He's just calling it out today. So God, in this passage, is asking his listeners to look at motivation. What's your motivation behind what you do? Is the motivation to enhance your self-image and look good in front of others? And get what you really want, get what you want, probably not what you really want, but what you think you want. Or is your life about keeping a relationship with God where everything else stays in relationship to God also? That's what Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is alluding to. I, I think that's a, it's a hard concept to get, but I'm going to use one that many of you have probably heard before with a triangle. You, you take a triangle and you put God up on top, or you could reverse and put him on the bottom because he supports everything. But I like the one where God's on top. And you put one person over here who's in a relationship, and you put the other person over here. And if they try to get together, you know what happens after a couple of weeks or months or years or decades. What happens to this relationship? Does it just go, ooh, love each other? Probably not. It probably ends up like this most of the time, and you tolerate each other. Well, God is saying in this passage, he said, you got God here and one person here and another person here. If you both strive to go to God and God strives to get to you, what happens after a while? This triangle. Get closer to God and what's happening to the two people? They're getting closer together. That's exactly right. And that's what he's saying here. You can't just do it yourself. You got to have God in there and moving toward God at all costs. You will come closer in relationship to the other person. That's what we're here for in the church, hopefully. You may want to say, but you know, what we do is human. That's true. But the challenge is, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And that needs to change probably your nature. In this passage, Matthew, Matthew is trying to get people to take a strong look at themselves. We change by having an encounter with Christ that prompts us to look at ourselves first, not the other person. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? What's going on? We have to look at what is really motivating us. We have to look at how we live and how we might be fooling ourselves. That's a tough, tough thing to do. The passage in Matthew here, as Jesus speaks, exposes what stands in the way of having an honest relationship with each other and with God. The good news of the gospel is about honest relationships. Just like God the Father has an honest relationship with the Son, and the Son has an honest relationship with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has a relationship with all of them. It's all about relationship. 
It's about loving one another, yeah, but it's about that relationship. And God says, you need to live like we do between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You need to live in a loving relationship that's honest. We don't deceive each other as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're honest with each other and say, if you live honestly, it may not be comfortable, but you have a way of getting closer to other people. Matthew points out in the reading that it's impossible to share in a heartfelt way what we call the good news, the gospel good news of love. It requires an honest relationship beginning with yourself. And having a relationship with Christ, which takes in everything, doesn't begin by trying to be good. Let's say that again. It doesn't begin by trying to be good. We all try to be good. That's not the way of salvation. You can't be good anyway. It takes grace to come down and to do something in your life. It begins with, however, a new experience. And the church, I think, has faulted many times. I can fault the church many times. Now in the past, of not showing people how to do new experiences. We don't become someone new by thinking about Christ. We do enough of that. You and I become someone by experiencing ourselves in a new way. Thinking is not an experience. You may think it is, but it's not. It's just, it's all up here. It's the head stuff. And with churches promote that by saying, come on, join us. Here's the confession, etc. Do you believe it? Yeah. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, you believe it. Okay, you're a member of the church. You got it all. And how does it connect to real life? Don't have to. You just got to say the right words. So Christians in delivering the good news do something. They have an experience that changes them. And their experience changes others. People sin because they do not want to really experience the goodness of God. They want to believe in goodness but not act on that belief. They want to pretend to stay good instead of risk sinning and having God rescue them. Richard Rohr would say that pretending to be good represents your false self. God likes real people. He likes the earth, the salt of the earth. Trusting in the experience of God always leads to relationship. It always does. Contemplative prayer is one way to find out that the experience of God is always waiting and it waits inside of you because you will know that the experience is there. We do things in this church with contemplative prayer that most churches don't. If you have any idea or want to explore that realm, you can talk to John and Virginia and Higgins, who are right back there. Raise your hands, guys. Okay, up there, who do some great stuff, as well as Paul um, Um, So there's something about getting in contact with how you do Christianity that way. Take a, take a, a minute and talk to them after church. Likewise, God is only, it's really only headspace unless others experience God in your presence. We call this witness. If you're in connection with God, you will witness to others. That doesn't mean about going up and taking the Bible and going around saying, here, believe in Jesus. That was the old concept that I had of witnessing to other people, that you had to convert them. That's just the whole thing. Um, I remember as a kid going around, and I must have been eight or nine years old, we got pamphlets that were passed out, you know, by the church and said, okay, here's your neighborhood. This is your block. Go around and deliver these to all the houses. I just hated it. I just, I think the people thought we were crazy. Now that I look back on it, that was probably a crazy thing to do because people need to be ready to hear about something. And they didn't need words. And they were using words, head stuff in that day. People want experiences. They want experiences of one person to another person to be able to connect. And I saw that, you know, this week, so, so uh, I was just moved almost to tears uh, watching CNN and watching the, uh, the earthquake in Turkey, and hopefully with some of it was Syria, but watching the mothers and fathers cry, just cry over their crushed children, rejoice when they found a child that was, was you know, alive. That is witnessing. That's the experience. Nobody's going around with the Bible saying you need to believe in God. I'm certainly when they were rejoicing, that was a rejoicing to God right there. That was a witness. <laughs> a witness so how do we take 
experience of God and witness this week. And so I try to make some connections here. That's Artie. He's down there. Um, he's my Valentine buddy. Uh, he's a good guy. We got uh, Valentine's Day, and that's that's about hearts, you know. And hearts are about love, but they're about experiences. And I don't know what you're going to do on your Valentine Day. Maybe it's uh, you know going out and getting getting somebody a card. Maybe it's uh, getting a box of candy. Maybe it's going out to dinner. Um, it's that kind of like one-on-one -on -one type of relationship. Uh, but God, I think, speaks to something more than that. God speaks about his heart. And his heart is open to everybody, including those whom you might feel love to. It includes those who you may not recognize. It includes the stranger. It includes the foreigner. Um, and so what I've done this week is something a little different. I have a box of cards, which are sitting in front of the baptismal font over here. They're blank. Nothing written. As you walk out, take a card this week. And as a witness, give it to somebody and just say, Happy Valentine's Day. And then listen. The biggest part of witnessing is to be able to listen to somebody else. If you're centered with God, you're going to be able to listen. If your mind's full of all kinds of stuff, you can't listen. And the person whom you're talking to knows that. You've had people who talk to you but you know they weren't really present you know they're kind of just go somewhere but to be really present centered with god is the witness it's the action you don't need words to do that saint francis would say that you know always preach the gospel oh and when necessary use words he was saying it's your actions that count so this week it gives you a chance to take a card for valentine's day give it to somebody you don't know give it to somebody in the grocery store somebody in the gas station Somebody that you see maybe fairly frequently, but you don't know their name. You just say, have a happy Thanksgiving or Valentine's Day. I did that this morning too. <laughs> have a happy Valentine's Day. And, and then listen. And just listen to see ones. Whether they say just thanks, whether they walk away, or whether they begin to share their story because that story needs to be told. We've come through an epidemic uh, um, of the COVID virus. We've come through uh, all kinds of uh, war stories. We see Ukraine. People have got all kinds of stuff they need to relate to and to talk with somebody. It doesn't mean to get the counseling session, but just to be present for a few moments with that person. That is witnessing. That's witnessing the gospel. So as you go out over there, the cards are in the middle. Don't forget them as you exit. Father Eric will remind you, hopefully. Maybe he will, otherwise I'll remind you. Um, and also then have a happy thanks uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs>